Welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 35 where we'll ask the question, what is the significance of the fossil record of ginkgo? Now the ginkgo is a very unusual plant belonging to the naked seed group, the geniosperms. But having traits uh, such as broad leaves that make it blend into the forest and belies the fact that this tree is a living fossil. Now most of us have heard of ginkgo as an herb extract. And indeed, the ginkgo has been cultivated for several centuries in China. Ancient Chinese texts record the plant as it was cultivated and eventually transported to Korea and Japan. And then during the 1720s, European botanists became interested in the plant and took seeds back to Europe where they were grown in European gardens. Eventually, they were brought to North America where they are often grown in urban settings. Now, several trees are actually growing on the Logan campus here at USU in Utah. And if you see any trees with these characteristic uh, leaves, then it's a ginkgo. Now, molecular studies have shown that the ginkgo originated from a Pleistocene refugia in mainland China, which was the last of its natural habitat for the species. This refugia of a natural population preserved this ancient plant, which Charles Darwin called a living fossil. The plant was on the brink of extinction during the great ice ages that swept across the northern hemisphere during the Pleistocene. Now, as will be described in this lecture, the fossil record of the ginkgo phyta goes all the way back to the Permian period, with modern ginkgos originating during the middle Mesozoic. So they're survivors of both the Permian-Triassic extinction event and the KT boundary uh, event that wiped out the dinosaurs. It was actually the cold climate that they didn't thrive in, but with warming temperatures, we may see more and more of these plants around us in our daily lives here in the United States. Now, there's only one species, the ginkgo bilobo, um, historically from a single refugia in the Tianmu Mountain Natural Re Reserve in mainland China. Now, post, most people know of ginkgo bilobo as this herbal supplement, and in fact, the nuts are actually eaten in, in traditional Asian cuisine. Now, the ginkgo is a living fossil. It's, it's, it's a plant that has a very long fossil record, and it's a member of a nearly extinct group, the ginkgo phyta. This is the fourth and final group of the gymnosperms, the naked seed plants that we're looking at in this course. I think what fascinates people most about ginkgos is that it resembles a conifer in some ways, but with these strange broad leaves that, that don't look like any leaves of any tree, uh, other tree that we know of. Now, like many gymnosperms, the ginkgo is deciduous. That is, that it has both male and female plants, um, which both have cones. The males produce the pollen, and the females have the ovia, and they produce the seeds. Now, often uh, city planters will plant only male plants in cities, and that's to avoid the fact that, that ginkgos produce these really stinky seeds and, um, during the summer months. And these seeds have like this really noticeable smell. They're, they're also sticky and they get on people's cars and on sidewalks and stuff. And they often elicit uh, complaints from the city dwellers. Now, the female gametophyte harbors the developing zygote, or the early seed embryo, in a fleshy encased seed. Now, the seeds are rather large, but don't mistake them for fruit, as the seeds lack an endosperm. Now, double fertilization has not been observed, so the seed is a result of a single egg sperm fertilization with the archegodium providing the fleshy part of the seed that you see, uh, see surrounding the developing sprout, the developing zygote. Now, female plants of ginkgos produce hundreds to thousands of seeds, which drop out of the tree. Now, unlike fruit-bearing trees, the seeds of ginkgos are rarely consumed by animals. They tend to have high levels of chemicals that in large doses cause convulsions. So you don't want to eat too many of the seeds. Squirrels and birds tend to leave them alone. With plenty of water in uh, temperate climates, the ginkgo do does well in many urban cities and even in colder or more extreme climates like here in Utah. Um, they can grow 
if cared for, and those seeds actually quickly grow into new ginkgo plants. Now many of the ginkgos that you find in urban areas are males, and to sex a tree you look for the male cones, which are these long and slender um, cones with lots and lots of pollen sacs. Um, they spread out of the whirl of, of the tree. You can see that really well with uh, right in there. Um, and some botanists have compared this to the condition that we see in cycads. So in that, the, the cones are within that central portion um, of the plant. But here in ginkgos, it's within each branch where the leaves bud out of, with this whirling pattern. So it's very different. Now, female plants do a very similar thing with their cones. Um, so here we have the ovia, or the developing female cones. Note that they are not arranged like in conifers into complex cones, but are independent, similar to what we see um, in cycads. So this is quite unique. So in fact, you know, ginkgos are wholly unique in terms of, of the way that they're doing this. And so oftentimes botanists view them as an early offshoot of seed plants going back into the Carboniferous. Now once fertilized, the ovia expands in the seeds or nuts of the ginkgo. And the seeds are really fleshy and they tend to have this really strong pungent smell. It's unknown if the smell is meant to prevent the seeds from being eaten or it's just a result of the chemicals that are harbored in the developing seeds. Now modern ginkgo trees can take on various forms as they grow. Um, both of these trees figured here are the same species, ginkgo biloba, but taken on a different appearance depending on uh, their history, how they are pruned, the place where they grow. They can appear to look more like conifers in form, like the top picture here, or they can take on the appearance of typical angiosperms like an apple tree. As such, they're chameleons and are often mistaken uh, for different species from far away. It's only when you get close to those characteristic leaves that you realize that it's a ginkgo. Ginkgos are very hardy plants. They can survive um, in areas of high pollution. And in fact, six are known to have survived the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. These trees are revered for their ability to survive and continue to grow. Note how the temple here was modified to allow one of these trees to grow unimpeded. One of the coolest and most amazing things about ginkgos is that they lose their leaves in the fall, just like angiosperm trees do. However, this is a gymnosperm. And rather than slowly losing leaves as the days get sh shorter, the ginkgo will rush things. With a very quick fall of leaves over a relatively short period of time, it's rather rare to see one of these events. Um, because over a course of an hour or so, an entire tree will lose all of its leaves. There are hundreds of great videos on YouTube that catch this amazing sight. If you're lucky enough to see a leaf fall of the ginkgo and realize what's happening, you're quick to grab your camera and to begin recording. Now the fact that the ginkgos lose their leaves and regrow them in the spring means there's a high chance of finding uh, fossil leaves of these plants in the fossil record. So here we have the independent origin of the fall colors and the loss of leaves seen in plants. This is because those broad leaves would be a problem with winter's snow. So here we have the independent origin of the fall colors and the loss of leaves seen in plants. Now this is because those broad leaves would be a problem with winter's snow. So here the leaves are lost and the tree then goes into dormancy for the winter. So now let's take a look at the fossil record of ginkophytes. Um, we're going to begin with some of the Paleozoic members and look at the leaf taxa that have been identified as fossil ginkophytes, or at least related to modern ginkgos. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the narrow mycophyll Dichophyllum morii, which um, you know has these needle-like leaves that look a little bit more like what you see in fossil conifers. It doesn't quite look like a ginkgo. Now, Dichoa phylon is found in the Pennsylvanian of Kansas in those same units as those early conifers, Wyweechia and Talenopterus, that we previously looked at. Now, this fossil is placed in a group called the Trichopithecian, which is thought to be ancestral to the Mesozoic ginkophytes. 
Trichophyla morii is named after the famous invertebrate paleontologist R.C. Moore at the University of Kansas, who started the great encyclopedia of fossils, the Treatises of Invertebrate Paleontology in the 1940s, and which continues to be published up to today. The next fossil we'll look at is Trichopithes, which is known from the Permian of France. It's also within the Trichopithecian family and viewed as a possible ancestor to later ginkgos. Note that it too has rather slender sort of needles and resembles fossil conifers or pine tree rather than a modern broad-leafed ginkgo. Now as we head into the early Mesozoic, we can see a transition among the fossil taxa to coalescing those narrow needle-like leaves into a more fan-like leaf structure. So this is Sphenobaria, uh, known from the early Jurassic of China. But it's also found throughout the Mesozoic of Eastern Europe and Asia, Greenland, and it's even been reported from the late Jurassic and Cretaceous here in North America. The next fossil ginkgo is the bushy leaf Zinacoaschia, which is found throughout the Mesozoic of Eurasia and is particularly speciose in the fossil record. In 1994, the well-known paleobotanist Sidney Ash described specimens from the late Jurassic Morrison formation here in the United States. Um, this plant is widespread during the Mesozoic in the Northern Hemisphere. Now throughout the Mesozoic there was a great diversity of ginkgo plants that were living. These plants were living in the same forests as the conifers and the cycads that we previously reviewed. They differ from modern ginkgos in having a more loosely constructed leaves of multiple narrow microfills or broad needles um, that make them look a little bit more like conifers and cycads than modern ginkgos. Hence we see a great diversity of gymnosperms, particularly during the Triassic and Jurassic. And the diversity of ginkgos then rather dramatically drops off near the end of the Cretaceous with a single group living through into the Cenozoic. All right, so let's look at some of these more modern fossil ginkgos in the Mesozoic era. All right, here we have the Triassic and Jurassic fossil ginkgodes, which is extremely widespread. It's known from every single continent, even Antarctica. Now, most of the other ginkgos that we've looked at are restricted to the northern hemisphere. That's not the case with ginkgodes, which has been found across South America, uh, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, as well as specimens from Europe and Asia, and with a few fossils known from here in North America. So the, this fossil really got around. It's very transitional leaf structure with a limited number of clusters or lobing leaves or dissections. So similar leaf structures can be found in some modern leaves of the living ginkgo bilobo. This feathering of the leaves is called dissection. So leaves that are highly dissected will have more of those narrow projections. We see a number of highly dissected leaves in the Mesozoic. Another highly dissected ginkgo fossil is the Jurassic fossil leaf Beria, known from the Jurassic. It's mostly found in the Northern Hemisphere with a few occurrences in Africa and South America. It's characterized by having leaves that are highly dissected with a feathered appearance. Fossils placed within the modern genus ginkgo are also known throughout the Mesozoic, even back into the Triassic. Now, the American paleontologist Roland Brown uh, grouped North American ginkgos into three species separate from the modern ginkgo bilobo. However, there are likely many species distinguished by some of these changes that we'll see in the leaf anatomy. There's a trend among ginkgos during the late Mesozoic and even into the Cenozoic of coalescing the leaf into a single lobe. This process helps, helps explain the very unique morphology of the modern ginkgo leaf the characteristically unusual lobes that make the leaf so recognizable. Now this trend is captured in the fossil record, moving from the highly dissected leaves of the early Mesozoic toward the modern lobe-like leaves found in modern plants. We should note that leaf morphology in a single tree can be very variable, so you need a large sample of fossil leaves to ensure that this trend is real rather than an artifact of preservation or the collection process. Let's now look at the fossil group of ginkophytes in terms of the changes in biogeography in abundance. Now I've downloaded data from the Paleobio database here to look at various trends. First we're going to look at fossils from the Permian, uh, which are really widespread. This is the time period that we have the supercontinent Pangaea. Most of them, but the big occurrence of them, occurring in what today is as Asia. 
During the Triassic, they're equally common, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere group, but they're also found in other continents. And you see some occurrences in the Triassic um, down in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, as we see the splitting of the supercontinent Pangaea in the Jurassic, uh, ginkgos are in both hemispheres. Uh, with some remains down there in South America, Australia, Africa, India, and Antarctica. But the vast majority of the occurrences are found in Asia. Now, during the Cretaceous, the number of ginkgo bearing sites drops dramatically, but we're still having a global extent. Much of the drop in abundance may be a factor of the rise of angiosperms, the flowering plants for which the ginkgos had to compete with. During the Cenozoic, ginkgos become very rare in the fossil record and are only found in a few sites, but are present in North America up into the Miocene. Now, one of the interesting patterns that you see with ginkgos during the Cenozoic um, is that they become more restricted in their geography with the global cooling down during the late Cenozoic. Now, during warm climates in the early Cenozoic and going back into the Mesozoic and the Cretaceous and Jurassic periods, fossil ginkgos lived at high paleolatitudes up above the Arctic Circle. But with the cooling temperatures during the age of ice, they have a more restricted geographic range with a, a single natural occurring forest today in China. Now, this graph here kind of mirrors what we know about the changing climates during the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. Now, the nice thing about the long fossil record of ginkgos is that we can use them to reconstruct the major biomes during the history of the Earth. Note where the major deserts and forests and grasslands at various times in Earth's past were. Now, such a long record of ginkgos give us, gives us a time-traveling plant so that we can study the plant today and use that as a proxy into insights about what the environment was like in the past. One of the really neat applications of fossil ginkgos is in the application of using them as a proxy for determining the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere during past periods of climate change. So remember that the leaves of ginkgos have stoma. In fact, all plants have stoma. These are tiny openings for gas exchange at the bottom of the leaves. Now, modern ginkgos uh, can be grown in labs at different amounts of CO2 in gas chambers. And it's been found that the higher the amount of CO2 available, the fewer and more widespread the stoma are on the leaves. So by counting the density of the stoma in fossil leaves, you can use a simple equation to calculate the atmospheric concentration of CO2 for any period for which ginkgos lived. This gives you a proxy record for CO2 going back all the way back to the Permian. And that's pretty cool. Dana Royler at Wesleyan University has been looking at this, as well as a number of other uh, paleobotanists like uh, Scott Wing at the Smithsonian. Now, this works really well with CO2 between 200 parts per million to 700 parts per million. And at really high concentrations above 700 parts per million, the plant doesn't necessarily respond as much. So they have to factor in uh, carbon isotopes in the plant into this equation. But here, for example, we have a record of CO2 concentrations for the last 65 million years. Note that there are some really high levels of CO2 during the early Cenozoic near the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, where CO2 was as high as 2,000 parts per million, although it may even be higher based on more recent studies. The trick is finding those fossil ginkgos. This graph is also based on the fossils of Metasequoia, the other really long-lived uh, gymnosperm fossil plant. All right, one last thing I'll mention about ginkgos is the Washington State Park in Vantage along the Columbian River. This is the Ginkgo Petrified Forest State Park. Um, George Beck in the 1930s discovered a whole bunch of fossilized petrified ginkgo logs at the site that are dated to the Miocene, so about 15 million years ago. Today it's a state park with a visitor center, and I've put a link below um, as well as on the class website of a YouTube uh, video of Kirk Johnson talking about the significance of this, fo uh, this fossil site up in Washington. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to learn more about uh, taking a geology class at Utah State University, check out their department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and my research, visit my website at benjamin
www.ontheroadtoconnection.org. Thanks again for watching.